Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Welcome to another episode of Cybersecurity Amplified and Intensified, the number one cybersecurity podcast with your host, Eric Taylor, myself, Shiva Maharaj, and today we have Gerald Auger. I hope I did not butcher that. It's Gerald Osher, but you Osher? Know, I'll, I'll respond to Auger. Yeah, no problem. I apologize. We have <laughs> Gerald Osher with us. What's going on, man? Nothing, just living the dream, you know? Gotcha. So who is Gerald Osher? Ah, uh, good question. Uh, passionate about cybersecurity, so I do it for a profession. I do it for a hobby. Um, you know, classically trained in computer science, but found my found my love for cybersecurity early, like maybe fifteen, seventeen years ago, and I've been practicing that. And uh, I don't I don't flex that I understand how to be a pen tester. I've been you know I've done labs and trained and stuff like that, but I came up. Or C track, I have had to do blue and get good at that just because of uh, manpower constraints. Uh, and now, you know, I, I run a, I, I, I run a uh, YouTube channel that gives back to the community and helps uh, mentor at scale in cybersecurity workforce development. And uh, just, just happy to talk about cybersecurity. What's the name of your channel? Yeah, it's Simply Cyber. So you can find it. It, actually, you know, simplycyber.io is the is my website, but I have a YouTube channel called Simply Cyber, uh, and I'm like all over LinkedIn as myself, Gerald Osier. So, okay, very cool, very cool. So, is Simply Cyber your primary focus? Like, is that your day job, or is it you do cybersecurity aspects of things during a day, and Simply Cyber is your hobby, weekend, nighttime stuff? So. Yeah, I, I would call Simply Cyber my hobby. Uh, it's grown into something much bigger uh, than just kind of like a, a tinkering project. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so my nine to five or whatever you want to call it, I'm an information security officer. I've, I've kind of came up the ranks in a more classical fashion, like I said, with a computer science education uh, and then working in, uh, in, in the IT side of the house. And then I moved over and slowly worked up from, you know, risk analyst one, if you want, all the way up to an information security officer. And I, you know, basically am accountable and have built a cybersecurity program for a mid-size, meaning $750 million manufacturing company that's, you know, a worldwide company. Uh, and I, I enjoy those challenges. But the cool thing is because cybersecurity is my life and, and something that I'm truly passionate about, I'm able to really fold together the things that I do on Simply Cyber with my day job. And I'll give you a great example. Every morning for the last, I don't know, year and a half, two years, I listen to a threat briefing, a cybersecurity threat briefing every morning with my coffee. It's like how I start my day. And maybe like uh, a month ago, two months ago, I figured, you know, like I've got a lot of experience. I know how to like um, understand what these stories are saying, extract out important, you know, call to action, whether it's educating your end user community or how to speak to IT about a certain issue, or even an opportunity to leverage a case study with executives that'll resonate with them so you can get money for your program. And in, instead of me just doing that for myself, I said, you know what, how about I turn on the, the camera? So now every morning at 8 a.m., I go live with very little preparation. I haven't even read the stories or listened to the brief. And I pull it up and I go through it with the Simply Cyber audience, which is like like 80 people at this point, which is pretty good. And, uh, you know, I play a story, I pause it, I give my reflections and chat goes, you know, uh, crazy. They talk to each other and share news. It's a tight 30 minutes and it's for Simply Cyber, but I'm doing it effectively at work. But the way I see it, that is work related because it's empowering me and enabling me to be able to be a better practitioner at my job that day. So there's a lot of, you know, synergy for lack of a buzz, you know, corporate buzzword. Gotcha. gotcha. Anything good in the news this morning that you covered? Um, yeah, th there's a couple things, you know, you, well, there's ma major tensions in Ukraine. So I'm not sure when you're going <laughs> to listen to this, but right now, uh, you know, Russia just defaced and took down several of Ukraine's major government uh, online presences, including, including the foreign ministry and left, left a essentially a, a terror note on the the page saying like so if you went to it it would say like this is just the beginning expect it to get worse written in russian for the ukrainians there was that and then you know interestingly enough too yesterday um the eu is actually started today a six week long um simulated multi-country um cybersecurity war simulation to attack supply chain exclusively which I found wild that they hadn't promoted that out. But at the same time, 
uh, you make yourself a pretty vulnerable target if you tell everybody that you're going to be doing this, you know, international simulation. Like if I was a threat adversary, that's exactly when I would attack you because you'd be like, oh, this is just, this is just dummy data. It's just a simulation. Yeah. All the Ukraine sites that were actually hacked by Russia was all running the same uh, CMS from the last I heard about, or last I read about, uh, about 30 minutes ago. So yeah, it was. Yeah. They hacked by Russia. You know, the interesting thing about the timing of the defacing of Ukrainian websites is the fact that Russia arrested members yes. of Revolt. Uh, yeah, I saw that this morning, morning or last night or, you know. Yeah, well, yeah, last night and then reported this morning. Yeah, the, the, the 17 of them, I believe, got arrested. Yeah. Yeah, the so, number is very fluid because I originally heard 11, then it went to 14, then 16, then 13. Uh, you know, but just if, like anything news related, it's all I still think it's interesting timing because, you know, the easiest thing for them says, hey, why would we do that to Ukraine when we were busy taking down Revil, mm -hmm. who caused so much havoc in the United States over the summer? Um, mm -hmm. So what do you think are the biggest uh, problems that you see in cybersecurity these days with your experience in the real world? Oh, wow. I mean, that's a really multifaceted question. So and the top two or three that keep you up at night and make you not want to shut your laptop off. Oh, okay. From that perspective, like threat adversaries, I thought you were talking about like, you know, the challenges of getting budget workforce development. That's all just, the... that's always going to be. Yeah. Yeah. So I think, I think, um, you know, obviously ransomware, um, goes without saying as, as really one of the top threats, which is, which is good because it's front page news it's common language and lexicon now so the executives know that so when you're asking for money um you can say it's for ransomware protection and you can get get that get that funds um the the problem is that ransomware is such a you know it's such a lucrative opportunity especially for people who are in financial crisis uh and there's very little retribution or or punishment right for for executing on it that it's going to continue to go. So, um, you know, we have protection technologies. I, I feel, unfortunately, like a lot of organizations focus heavily on uh, business continuity and recovery from ransomware attack and pay mm -hmm. a little less mind to the, the upstream of like having it not happen in the first place. Um, so that that keeps me awake uh, in some capacities. Um, obviously, another thing in the the threat the threat can change, right? But another thing that is really uh, something that I've put a lot of effort into to make myself feel better, think about mitigating my risk down, is um, is end users doing end user things, right? So, you know, if 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 Carl works in accounting, like he's worried about Excel and numbers and, and keeping the books right. And, and like, that's his job, his focus. He's not focused on, you know, best cyber hygiene practices and these type of things. So that's, you know, the social engineering aspect of having someone accidentally click and download something or fall for a IT support scam and stuff like that. Um, it, it, that keeps me up because essentially, as you know, you know, <laughs> like anyone can send anyone an email. And if you have poor controls around email security, you know, it can get to someone who can fall for it. So um, just again, as, as we talk about that particular risk, I, I, I have actually taken a really innovative, I would call innovative novel approach to information security awareness at my organization and in my last organization as well, that I think has a material improvement on overall cyber hygiene for the end user community and the effectiveness of, of, of them not falling for stuff and making bad decisions. So, so wait, well, if I can interject real quick before we go down that rabbit hole, that, that when you're going back to ransomware. Me and Shiv have had this conversation a lot of times and, you know, don't you think just because you're saying it's because of, because of ransomware, everybody is, you know, over, no, or they're numb to the word of ransomware. They're numb to that threat because it's so in their face, you know, not to get political, but you say the word COVID, you know, you either you get people that are over energized about it or people that want you to tell you to shut the F up and, you know, it's. It's kind of the same thing when you talk about ransomware, I think, uh, you know, so how do you think that that really plays out when you're trying to structure and, you know, get people more secure? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think one of the key differences there is with COVID, it's more of an individually affecting situation and ransomware, it's more of an organizational affecting situation. So you, you can feel more like it's an us than, than a me type thing. As far as, as ransomware goes, it's all about money. 
right? Like, if if it if it isn't happening to you, then you, it's not really in your face. But when you see something like Colonial Pipeline, or more importantly, something that's in your same sector, so like let's say healthcare, you see a clinic. You know, it doesn't have to be down the street, but you see a clinic or a physician's practice get ransomware and they have to close the doors. That perks up, especially when the news stories are being placed into the 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 journals that you read, right? So it's like it's on Newsweek. It's not in IT Security Magazine, which you're not going to be reading. Anyways, so it get it resonates with them. And I'll tell you something that I have seen firsthand in the last 12 months that is absolutely driving this as a top uh, initiative, oddly, is cybersecurity insurance, right? Mm-hmm. So, you know, businesses use insurance to cover, you know, like liability. And what we're finding is that they are getting like, let's say a million dollars coverage and ransomware coverage was just getting thrown or cybersecurity insurance coverage was just getting thrown in there originally just for privacy data breach and handling that, but now it's moved into ransomware and the premiums are going up because the insurance companies are paying out their mouth. And what has happened is it comes up for time for renewal. And let's say that you could get um, a $2 million policy for $10,000 uh, last year, two years ago, mm-hmm. and it comes up for renewal and it's it's literally 8x right so now the the line item is you know 250 grand for cyber insurance um for a million dollar coverage so more pre- more premium lower policy you know the cfos are saying why wait like what like we need the insurance right because that's our solution to ransomware we need that <laughs> but why is it 8x and the insurance companies are saying because you don't have mfa you don't have you have poor patching you don't have privileged access management all these things and here's the really messed up thing. They'll say, okay, like if you put these things in place, you can have the same rate that we gave you last time. Otherwise, it's going to be 8X. And now the insurance companies are effectively driving the cybersecurity program. And one of the challenging conversations is actually having the CFO say to, you know, whatever the CIO, hey, put in PAM, MFA, and network segmentation because the policies do February 1st. Uh, so just knock that out in the next two weeks, which we as practitioners are well aware that that's an insanely ridiculous ask, like mm-hmm. c- completely unrealistic. Yeah. The one thing that, you know, has always drove me a little nuts, especially when coming in on an IR, they're like, well, if our backups would have just worked, that none of this would have been a problem. Like you realize that a lot, while some of it is backup related, you know, it will mitigate your downtime, but most of the threat actors are doing data exfiltration they're going to sell your data. And for most companies, it's not a big deal. You know, your auto body shop down the road probably doesn't care, right? That their client list gets leaked out, but you know, a lot of manufacturing doesn't want their client list leaked out. So, you know, I think by insurance companies really starting to enforce more of a granular auditing, if you will, to at least some degree, it's getting the businesses owners out of just the, well, if we just have really damn good backups, we'll be okay. Mm-hmm. The, the problem I see there is that the insurance companies are creating a environment for self-attestation for you to say that, yes, we have all this in place and they're hoping you lie. So when you have an incident, they come in and they ask proof for proof of it. They can deny your claim. Yeah. That's the flip yeah. side to all of this. Yeah. And that's definitely, that's definitely going to happen. Uh, I know, you know, I talk to other, you know, information security officers for, you know, whatever um, information sharing and a lot of them and myself are being asked for these things and we're testing truly, but I agree with you, Shiva, that there's definitely going to be people who don't want to, you know, upset the CFO or whatever and are going to lie. And you're, you're right. Like we're going to, we're going to be hearing about situations. Well, you would hope that we'd hear about situations where um, those insurance companies aren't going to pay out for, for that exact reason, because you, you basically uh, invalidated your your policy. I think that's going to be this year, or next year. I think that's I'm where we're going to get the high water mark of that. I'm already seeing it on the IR because you know we'll go through the entire, and this has just started happening within the last two months. We'll go through an entire incident response case, and we are specifically told, "Do not give us your final report. Do not send it to us." Because it's considered discoverable. Yeah. They want so, they want you to read the report to them but or discuss the report with them, but they do not want exactly a paper trail on it. Well, and another interesting thing, Eric, I'd be interested on your experience and, and perspective on this. Another thing that we're seeing is that the insurance company is dictating the incident response uh, company or incident response team 
that is authorized to execute on behalf of uh, any any um, incident that's going to result in trying to you know access your policy for um, financial uh, compensation. So you know, like if you're in a pinch and they call Eric because you helped him last time, and then you start doing executing IR, you like uh, you invalidate the policy just by by them trying to do the right thing. So that is a little bit of a gray area. So when we anytime we get a new case that comes to to us, uh, either directly or through referral. Uh, the first, one of the first questions I ask is, do you have an insurance policy or cybersecurity policy? And I review it. The, a lot of the policies will allow a company like ours to at least get started. We're allowed to go in and do a containment and start an assessment. Is there still data exfiltration going on? You know, doing the, at least the containment and at least brokering the communication with the hackers. It is allowed by most, if not all, I wouldn't say all, but most cybersecurity policies, um, especially if it's on a weekend, things of that nature. Um, some policies have panels, so only approved companies are allowed to work on certain cases. And again, the, some of them are allowing the customer to use a third party firm, you know, because they have their own internal or external. And I'll tell you what, if. I could not line up enough customers right now that will tell you to never use an insurance's IR firm. They are literally the worst that they don't care because they're, they're paid by the insurance company and they're hired. Owned. They're often yeah. owned by the insurance company. Exactly. That's the other slippery slope for that. Yeah. So they don't care if it takes them two months, whatever that they, they don't have the customer's interest at heart. So. Where a company like us or Avaca or Kroll or Coveware or something like that, we work for the company, mm -hmm. right? So, interesting. It, it's a it's it's a mess. I mean, I've got one case right now where I've been fired and hired three times. What was the last one? Uh, hired. There you go. That's a win for now. Till the next <laughs> for <time>. now, <laughs> until the insurance company comes back again and be like, ah, you know, no, we're, we can do this, and yeah. But it's, it's a freaking mess. It really is. So what else is driving you to make change in your org and also as part of Simply Cyber to help educate people? Because I think when I looked at uh, Simply Cyber, it really looked like that's what your goal is to help educate people. Yeah. I mean, Simply Cyber uh, began initially as uh, me. Okay. So originally Simply Cyber started because I'm sure like you guys, as practitioners that have been around for a minute, uh, our community is is now at this point in, in 2022, like it's more of an inclusive community. Toxicity isn't really um, tolerated. And I get asked a lot of questions because cybersecurity. <laughs> sorry, sorry. You, got, you, you, got, you apparently have not been on Twitter. <laughs> well, I do, I do kind of, um, yeah. So I, I know all about that on Twitter. I try to stay clear of that, like, I, I spent a lot more time in discords, um, security discords, which mm -hmm. are better policed. But yeah, Twitter's Twitter's kind of a cesspool. But so yeah, but like you guys, I get I get asked questions a lot, the same questions, right? Because people, our field is hot, our field is uh, front and center, and um, I get asked questions a lot, like, hey, hey, how do I do this, or what would you recommend about that, or what do you say about this? So. I don't want to say that I got tired of saying the same answer again and again, but I saw it as an opportunity to mentor at scale. And, and really, honestly, I don't have a ton of free time. So my, my time is valuable. So if I can make it more uh, accessible for other people in a way, I can. So I started making these videos that are answering the FAQs, for lack of a better term, that I get. So then when someone messages me, I say, hey, like, hey, you know, like, I'd love to help you check out this video. It'll answer 80% of all the questions that you have. And then if you still have questions, come back to me and we'll talk. And most of the time, um, people won't come back. So I'm assuming either they weren't serious about it, which is great because I didn't spend my time helping someone who wasn't serious, or two, it answered their question and they've moved on to, to other things. Uh, sometimes they'll come back and they'll ask a follow-up question, a deeper question, something that's more actionable and, 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 and I, it shows me that they're committed. Uh, and then I'll work with them. And then, you know, so that's kind of where it began. But then now at this point, uh, there is a Simply Cyber Discord server, which is really a Simply Cyber uh, community home, if you will. And there's a lot of people who are regulars in that community and you know help each other and know each other's stories. 
And yeah, we're still mentoring as far as like, this is how you do that or check out this lab or whatever, but it's evolved into something much greater, which is not what I had anticipated with simply cyber. So now at this point, I feel almost like a, a responsibility to continue um, providing and, and leading, for lack of a better term, uh, this community into into greatness and, and achieving uh, good things. So th that's really what's happened with Simply Cyber. Yeah. That's pretty cool. You know, there's one of uh, my mentors, uh, John Strand, who does a, a former SANS instructor, does Black Hills information. Yeah. Yeah. But he's always saying, you know, you can literally take the same topic, line up 30 people to educate on that, do it a different way and reach thousands of people. So it's awesome, man. Yeah, so yeah, I'm, cool. I'm a huge advocate of that. So, you know, I'm trying to work with actually SANS to, you know, do more educational stuff like that. So, um, it's, it's going to be a good year, I think. Yeah. And John, I mean, John was just on my show. So I do, I do live streams on Thursday where I have a guest on and we talk about something specific. John was actually on last Thursday to talk about, um, his pay what you can, mm, uh, yeah. model, right. Cause he's got three courses where, um, it covers, you know, different things in the, in the industry that are awesome. And his, his whole underlying philosophy is like, um, you know, people who have different backgrounds, right. Uh, single mother of three, uh, native American, someone who's a 50 year old, like not, not like there shouldn't be gates for people. It shouldn't just be like white males who had a college education that have access to, um, mm -hmm. opportunity. And, and that's really what he's doing with his pay what you can thing, which is why I had him on. Cause it's just such a great program. Yeah, the pay that what you can is actually, and I'm not going, I'm not sitting here trying to toot my own horn, but the, um, I actually contributed to that a couple of times last year where paid for, cause I think the full course is like just under 500 bucks or something mm -hmm. like that. Um, so I helped sponsor at least four or five people last year. So hopefully that worked out well for some folks, but yeah, you know, being able to be able to give back like that, it's pretty cool. And yeah. John's an awesome, awesome dude. Yeah. He's a role model. Yep. So what else are you working on as the next iteration for you, I guess you and simply cyber? Uh, yeah, thanks for asking me that, you know, uh, I've got a bunch of projects going on, but one that I'm really excited about, um, and, and I want to share with you is, uh, I'm working on, so in addition to working as an information security officer and doing simply cyber, I'm also a, a adjunct faculty at the Citadel military college. And I, I teach in their cyber sciences department. So I, I've been doing that for like, I don't know, two and a half, three years now. So I've kind of gotten like, um, not a flair, but like I've developed kind of like educational kind of skill set or delivering education. And I get asked all the time, um, where can I get GRC training, right? Because we like, just to back up a second, if, if you don't know when you're listening to this, like the red side has had great training and, and very pointed training and overall training for years. The blue side just got some stuff like the last year and a half, like SaaS solutions with like cyber ranges and stuff like that. But when people ask me, and GRC is getting some some serious like love now, and people ask me, where do I get GRC training? And like literally, I've been saying for like six months, like, well, you can go to NIST and download the special publication and read through it. That's the best I can offer you right now. And like that is fine, but it's it, NIST documentation is uh, cumbersome and it's very thorough. And it's more of a reference than it is a guide. So if you're not even equipped to like digest NIST, it's really confusing. So it dawned on me like maybe a month ago that like there's no GRC training that I'm aware of that's worth anything. So I came up the GRC track, as I mentioned at the beginning, I could easily make a course. So on Black Friday, I bought a teachable license 50% off or something, and I'm working on a GRC course. And what is so exciting about it, at least in my opinion, right, to geek out a bit, is GRC is really seen as like the non-technical arm of information security and kind of boring and clipboard and audit and all this other stuff. So how can I make it not just educational and, and smart, but how can I make it practical as well? And my favorite part is have resume bullets. So the way I've broken it up is, you know, here's a primer on cybersecurity. I have to do that in case you're coming from like nowhere. Um, and then like, here's a module on compliance in audit. Here's a module on security awareness. Here's a module on governance. And within it, I teach a bunch of like theoretical stuff, right? These are different compliance frameworks. This is why compliance happens. All these things that you need to know from an education perspective. But then I have a, a lab, like 
let's let's do an audit. Like we're going to audit a, se a section of PCI and this is the, what the standard is and this is how you do an audit and this is why the, who you're going to interview and stuff like that. And it's all simulated. It's not like you're actually auditing anyone, but you work through the lab. And if you do the lab, like at the end of each module, I have resume bullets that you've unlocked. So by the end of the entire course, you could have a pretty beefy practical skills resume um, developed and, and really understand what the hell you're talking about, frankly, uh, in a GRC uh, risk analyst role. So that's what I'm working on right now. I'm about 60% completed and I'm How really excited about it. Uh, in what way? Like hours or modules? Uh, in hours, or, I guess, or both. Uh, you know, it's probably, it's, it's not that long, like maybe 15 hours. Like I'm not trying to make it overwhelming. I, I think it's six, it's six modules. Uh, I try to keep, when I say modules, like security awareness is a module. Like I have one at the end on how to get a job too. So you can take your resume that you just got and, you know, here's how you find a job. Here's how you interview correctly. And, um, I'm, I'm saying maybe 15 hours. I haven't really measured it, but I try to make the sections within each module, like. 15 minutes or less because I found people don't really want to sit down for an hour lecture, right? They want, they want a consumable bite and then have a nice time to stop. And then kind of like binge watching on Netflix. Like you're like, Oh, I could do a little bit more. I could do a little bit more. So instead of like, you know, a two hour video. Um, so I'd say, yeah, maybe 15 hours. It's kind of hard to say because with the labs, like it depends on how long it's going to take someone to execute on the lab and, and, um, and do all that. Right. So. Okay. Cool. I'll tell you what, those are those guys, they would hate to sit through a science class. Holy moly. <laughs> Six yeah. days, eight to ten hours a day, and you're just melted. Brain is just oozing out your ears. You're just like, err. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there is a, a point of diminishing returns, right? Where you're just oh, yeah. not even consuming anything anymore. And, and for me, I actually thought long and hard about this, and I did some research. And it's not about length, right? It's It's not about amount of time that you put into it that determines the value of it. To me, the value is, is there a transformation for the student from when they came in to when they exit the program? And I, and I, I feel like I'm delivering on that uh, just in a concise fashion. Yeah, that just uh, retained knowledge from what you got, right? So I think that's the, the key words there is, you know, how much are you retaining? Yeah. You are it, when are you planning on launching? I was, you know, it's funny. I was planning on doing it um, February 1st and I was going to have beta testers here in um, like basically starting tomorrow, have like five or six beta testers go through, give me feedback and make edits. But I've got some personal stuff going on right now that's kind of pushed that, uh, unfortunately. So I would say end of Q1, uh, I definitely would like to get it out. Even if it's in like some type of draft format, I want to get it published. Uh, cause that's going to basically, uh, hold myself accountable because people are going to start messaging me and say like, this is an incomplete course and stuff. And I don't, I don't like that. Um, another thing just to touch on it, cause we talked about John, I was, a I I've been trying to figure out how to price this course. And after John was on, on last millions. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, after John was like, originally I was thinking like $79, that's kind of like the sweet spot. And then I was thinking, I love what. Keith uh, Adams is doing it's Cyber Mentor. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Like it, it's so nice. It's basically like thirty bucks a course, and it's wicked accessible. And he runs fifty percent off coupons all the time. And I liked that. But after watching John, I think I might price it seventy nine, like I was going to, and, and then make it a pay what you can and have um, coupon codes that say I only pay zero, I only pay ten, I only pay twenty. And um, yeah, I mean, he's already proven it as a viable model that people, yeah, you probably get some people who could afford it and then pay zero, but most people mm -hmm. are paying what they think is fair value for it. He's even said that people did it for free and then they came back and bought it almost like they, after they were done with the course, they paid what they thought it was worth in value. So, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm motivated and inspired about making it accessible to people who may not have access to it because they don't have, because they're 15 and they're in a broken home and they don't have $80. Well, Heath also has a monthly plan as well. And, you know, I'm just subscribed to that just to help him out because, yeah. you know, between him and Stoke and a couple other folks that are on, you know, Twitter and the bug bounty program, you know, a lot of some of their stuff that they did, you know, helped advance my penetration testing by, you know, watching and following them and meeting with them and stuff like that. So, you know, that may be something that you do is, you know, a monthly plan. I don't know mm -hmm. how well that's going to really work with a one course thing, but, you know, I don't know. Something. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's it's a good point. It it is a good point. Um, I I would probably not because I'm I'm not really in like the course curriculum development world. Like this was basically uh, a gap that I heard the community like basically like not begging to have filled, but like there's there's a need there, and I have the capability to fill that need. So I I was just making it. I'm not interested in like like good on Heath. Like the Cyber Mentor Academy is awesome, mm-hmm. uh, but that's not really where where I want to go or or take I like career. the I like you know your idea of this seventy nine eighty dollar price point pay what you can because at that point you're more of a pay it forward type of exactly arrangement which I think is mm-hmm. what you're looking for aside yeah. from helping and, people learn yeah and I mean money's nice but like I have a great full time job and like simply cyber makes a little bit of scratch right like, you you know what I mean like I'm I'm not I'm not, I'm, I'm okay. Like I can, I can offer this at for $0 if someone, if that's what they can afford and I'm okay, you know? No, good on you, man. I wish there were more people like that who could put together quality coursework and say, Hey, it's a pay what you can thing because all too often, I think in our field and many other fields, there's so many people selling courses Mm -hmm. probably Uh should not be putting courses together or be near a computer. I'm trying to be politically nice, correct, or whatever you want to call it today. Uh, it's 2022. I'm trying to be nice here. But, you know, listen, when you launch it, let me know. I'll buy yeah, absolutely. it. Or maybe I'll sponsor. I'll, you know what, listeners? I will sponsor five listeners of this podcast. You get in touch with me, and I will buy Gerald's course for you. Well, let's read the pot. Shiva will do five. I'll do five. Let's put 10 people through. Thanks, guys. That's I appreciate that. No, yeah, thank you. Man. I mean, I think it's a service to the community. So that's pretty much it for me for questions. Is there anything else you wanted to go over, Gerald? Gerald? Uh, yeah, let me think. Um, well, I guess just to kind of promote, uh, promote something and, and share with, because I really find that there's value um, in it. I mentioned earlier about doing this, you know, morning daily cybersecurity threat briefing. I do it mm-hmm. weekdays, you know, and I, I'm teaching at university right now. School just started back into session. So Tuesday and Thursday mornings, I teach at 8 a.m. So like it's a little bit later in the day, but normally it's 8 a.m. And I really think people should check it out, not because it's like pumping my numbers or I, I have an ego or anything like that, but whether or not you're trying to break into the field or you're a practitioner, there's value there because I will tell you, and you guys, you know, let me know your thoughts on this. When you're in an interview for a cybersecurity job, you will be guaranteed to ask, how do you stay current on cybersecurity? It, it's, it's, it's so important. Not Reddit. Reddit is not the correct answer. <laughs> yes, Reddit's not the correct answer. I mean, Twitter, I, you know, we hear Twitter. Uh, it could go either way for Twitter, but definitely not Reddit. Yeah, but, but if, you, if you are attending this, uh, this morning threat briefing, you are getting up-to-date threat intel. And personally, I feel that I um, can boil it down and like call out what is actually going on or what's valid in the story or like you don't get confused in the in the noise right it's just a distilled message of here's what you need to know um for me um and I, people are are finding value in it uh on understanding what's going on so it's helping them uh develop professionally and and get that career and then if you're a practitioner i mean you really should be staying informed on what's going on so yep. what better way to do it than uh with a bunch of other cybersecurity practitioners so the cool thing is it's not just me talking and you sitting there listening. There's like 70 or 80 people in chat all talking about the story at the same time. Like, oh, like I heard about this or did, you know, this is affecting healthcare or that this isn't true in Europe right now. Or, you know, like it's it's very involved and very dynamic, but very accessible and very inclusive. There's no toxicity um, in chat, right? Like it's, it's, it's awesome. Like I really... Like it's 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 a coincidence that I happen to be the one running it. Like if I was just an attendee in it, I'd be telling you the same thing to check it out. And just to recap here, it's eight o'clock weekday mornings. Yeah, eight a.m. Yeah, if you go to the, like if you go to the uh, Simply Cyber YouTube channel, you'll see it under like upcoming live streams because like basically on Saturday I, I I schedule out the next five for the upcoming okay. week and then I execute on it and rinse and repeat. Um, or just connect with me on. Um, uh, well, the cool thing is I stream it live on. LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook, and Twitch all simultaneously. Not that I'm like trying to get Twitch or Facebook people, but I, it's just another click of the button. So I do it anyways. Uh, but um, LinkedIn, a lot of people tune in from LinkedIn because, um, you know, it's first thing in the morning, you're having coffee and it's like, oh, Jerry's live with this thing. So uh, e- either one, just connect with me if you can't find it. 
Sounds good. And we will have all of the links on how to get in touch in the description for the episode. Great. Thank you for having me, guys. Oh, thank you. It's all been right. a pleasure, man. Thanks. Ladies and gentlemen, and ghouls that are out there on the internet, if you have made it this far, thank you so much for tuning in for yet another episode of Amplified and Intensified.com. You know what? A recent change to the platform. Shiva has put together a new website, Amplified and Intensified.com. If you have heard anything that you have liked about this podcast and you want to engage Shiva or myself or be able to help sponsor by donating us some, some coffee, all the links of our calendars, buying us coffee, past episodes of both the podcast and the YouTube version are all now on Amplified and Intensified. Dot com. Go there for all of your needs. Thank you so much. And until next time, take care.